Hi, everybody. Uh, you should be hearing the audio now. Um, this is Nick Sakurai. I am the Director of Leadership Initiatives in the LGBT Equity Center. I uh, will be speaking much more a bit later, um, but I'm just speaking now so that you can hear the audio and make sure that it is working for you. If you have any question about that, uh, you can do a private chat with Sika Wheeler, who is in the host section. Um, also, I go by they, them pronouns. And now we will jump right into the session. Um, so that you know, um, we're here um, with myself as a staff member in the LGBT Equity Center, and we're here with several students who are peer educators who are uh, working on this webinar as well. Welcome to this webinar on LGBTQ plus terminology and concepts, presented by the Rainbow Terrapin Network, a program of the LGBT Equity Center at the University of Maryland, College Park. My name is Judith, and I go by she, her, and hers pronouns. I'm a sophomore at the University of Maryland. In this webinar, we will give you some introduction and talk a bit about why this topic matters. We'll talk about some overarching principles around inclusive language, and then we'll dive into the core of this session, the vocabulary and concepts. We'll also share some resources, reserve time for some questions and answers, and give you some possible action steps you can take after this session is over. Before we begin, we want to remind you that this session is being recorded and will be made, pub be made available publicly publicly afterwards. Anything you share in this chat box becomes part of that recording. This webinar is focusing on some baseline terminology and concepts, and it's geared towards University of Maryland College Park constituents. We won't be able to cover anything close to everything there is to know about these topics, but we will try hard to give you a great overview. Some of these topics can get confusing, so we encourage your questions but we also encourage you to seek out additional information or to review this webinar again after we are done. Hi, my name is Michael and I go by he, him, his pronouns. I'm a senior here at the University of Maryland. Why does talking about LGBTQ plus terminology and concepts matter? For those of you listening in live, take a moment to think about this. And if you'd like to share why this matters to you, take a moment and type into the chat box. You can even just uh, type a brief word or phrase. Uh, people have the right idea in that respecting people's identity is extremely important and language is a very important step in doing that. GLAAD, a national organization focusing on LGBTQ representation in the media, says that words matter in entertainment media, entertainment media in journalism, and in our lives. Using language well can help us create inclusion. At a university that seeks to ensure all people have access to programs and services, considering how our language impacts our interactions can make a big difference. Great, so this is Nick Sakurai again. I go by they and them pronouns. Um, I'm going to be leading us through this next big section of our session where we're really going to dive more into actual language, terminology, and some concepts. What I want to start with are some overarching principles. One is that you know, lifelong learning matters. This is not something that um, you can understand, I think, in the first pass. Um, and I think that there's always information that's changing when it comes to terminology and the way that people use language in their lives. So keeping that in mind and keeping in mind that you'll likely have to review this material um, a few times. Uh, 
recognizing the context also can matter. You know, the way people use words in different cultures, in different spaces, in different places, uh, makes a difference. And what people mean by the words that they're using can vary from person to person. So recognizing context is important. And following from that is honoring self-determination. You know, that this is not about labeling other people. We are going to talk about a lot of different words, um, but the point is not to use those words to then go and label everything. It's more so that when we're engaged in conversations about sexuality and gender, that we're able to have meaningful conversations where we're understanding what each other is saying. Um, some of what we'll talk about is also language that we might want to avoid because it could be problematic. Um, but if somebody says, this is my name, or these are the pronouns I go by, the principle is essentially honoring the, the pronouns that somebody goes by, honoring the name that somebody goes by. And if somebody says, I'm bisexual, you know, if, if it comes up in conversation, then, you know, recognizing that person's bisexual and not then calling that person gay or something that they didn't use as a term to identify themselves. Um, and then finally, seeking clarity in respectful and sensitive ways. So, you know, I don't want us to think that this is about learning the dictionary because there are hundreds more words that we could learn beyond the ones we'll talk about today. Um, but that this is about getting some baseline terminology in place, but also thinking about ways that you can get more information. You know, whether that's looking online, uh, Googling it, <laughs> and, but there are other ways to find out what something means. Talking to other people, asking a person what did you mean by that, um, or what does that mean to you, uh, could be helpful strategies in thinking about respectful ways to uh, get clarification and be sensitive and understand what's happening around you when people are using certain words. Um, so not always putting somebody in a spot where um, they're asked something private or that seems really personal, um, but if somebody's using a word, you know, asking them politely, what does that mean to you, could really help clarify in a conversation. Um, throughout this, this section um, and this session, feel free to enter questions into the chat box. We'll also have a Q&A section a bit later. So to jump right in to some vocabulary and concepts. Um, well, first, of some reminders. Uh, I did mention you'll probably have to review this multiple times, especially if it's new to you. But that language is also fluid and contested. Um, so like I said, there are hundreds of other terms that could be included. We did not include every term. Um, that doesn't mean that the other terms are not important. Um, and it's that however I describe what the definition of something is, you may find that there are others who disagree or who use the same terms in a slightly different or very different way. And so just noticing that can be important. A really important conceptual piece I want to start with, because we're going to start with this conversation by talking about sex and gender before we talk about sexuality, I want to clarify that being gay or being bisexual is not a gender, you know, at least to most people. That's a sexuality. And being transgender is not a sexual orientation, right? So we use this acronym LGBTQ plus um, pretty frequently in our work, but it really combines a lot of different people, identities, and concepts into the same uh, acronym. And so I want to just mention these are really disparate concepts. Any questions so far? All right, so as I had said, we're going to come to sexuality in just a moment. So I wanted to start with sex and gender and what the differences are between them. Um, usually when I ask folks what is the difference, I hear people talk about gender is more social, sex is, tends to be more about your body or more medicalized. Some people say, you know, they see gender as being that's the social construct and sex is to them more some fixed thing. And I think in reality that both of these could be social constructs, or viewed as social constructs. Uh, really any concept, any language is a social construct on some level um, in that we've created these terms, we've defined them certain ways, and in a social setting people use them in different ways. So even sex and what sex 
is constituted by, may be debated by uh, doctors, lawyers, practitioners, individuals about their own experiences. So on this slide, you're seeing some components that are typically associated with concepts of sex versus gender. Both of them could have something to do with documentation, legal, or government documents, for example. Often the two terms are used interchangeably in the law. Um, but in sort of social theory and the way we discuss it in um, LGBTQ plus community, some of these differences you can see here about anatomy, chromosomes, hormones, and development are more related to sex. And identity, expression, socialization, and culture are more related to gender. So a couple examples then of the most common um, examples of a sex would be female or male, and there's also intersex, which are folks who, um, it could be their legal documentation, it could be anatomy, it could be chromosomes that may not fit to normative ideas of what constitutes male or female. Um, some intersex people may also see themselves as male or female, or may not see themselves as male or female. And then on the side here on gender, you have uh, women and men, uh, which is the majority of the population, but you also have non-binary. And non-binary is a pretty large category that can include a variety of different uh, gender identities, including not having a gender at all, including being both a man and a woman, being part, you know, fluid or part of different genders at different moments. And so non-binary is simply a catch-all in many ways of uh, folks that may not fit into being a man or woman. Now, now we're going to talk about sexual orientation and gender identity. So here you have a pretty basic definition for each one. So sexual orientation, it's about attraction. Who are you interested in? And usually as it is relative to gender. So it may be that you're not attracted to anyone. And it might be that you're attracted to people of a variety of genders. Or maybe that you're only attracted to people of one particular gender. So that's sexual orientation. So sexual orientation sort of requires that other people exist in the world. Uh, gender identity, on the other hand, is not necessarily about attraction. It, you know, some people view attraction as some component of what your gender is, but um, by and large, it's just who you are as an individual, and it may have nothing to do with your sexuality at all. It could be means if you are a man or a woman uh, in between both or something else or neither. So gender identity is usually seen as one piece of the word we were just talking about, which was gender. Other parts of gender might include your gender expression or, um, you know, your sort of socialization around gender might be another piece. Or looking at gender roles in society may be a part of gender um, that may not be the same for everyone in their own personal and individual identity. Feel free, again, if you have a question, if this is at all um, confusing. Just go ahead and type that into the chat box, and I'm happy to uh, answer some as we go along. So we talked about sex and gender, and then we talked about sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so here are some actual examples then. Here are examples on the left of sexual orientation. And then on the right, um, really these could be combined into one section, some examples of gender identity. Now, if you could, just as you're looking at these, maybe type into the chat, chat box one or two of these terms that you see on your screen uh, that, may be, um, that may be more confusing or that might be new for you, ones that you're less familiar with. Go ahead and let us know what those are. All right. So we've got bi-gender, pansexual, agender, fluid, genderqueer, cisgender. So there's lots of terms here that may be less familiar to folks. Well, why don't we start on the left-hand side um, and look at sexual orientation. So, of course, the most typical one is going to be heterosexual. Um, some folks would say straight. And some folks have asked me, well, is heterosexual an okay term? Because, as we'll talk about a little bit later, we recommend avoiding the term homosexual 
because of some of its uh, negative connotations as being clinical or pathologized. Um, but heterosexual just doesn't have the same power edge to it. Um, and so because of that, uh, we, we find it an acceptable term to use for most folks. So that's heterosexual. You've got gay and lesbian. Um, I don't see any questions about what those terms mean. Gay, um, you know, for some folks is associated with men, but could be referring to people of any gender and usually is referring to same-sex attraction. Uh, lesbian, usually referring to women who are interested in other women. And then we'll address the other terms. Um, so with uh, sexual orientation, what I want to mention is um, sexuality does have many components to it. It could be uh, romantic attraction, it could be sexual attraction, so there are other ways of looking at this, um, or multiple ways of looking at this. Uh, with the term queer, that one has a long uh, history, you know, it's been used in many different ways, and some people find it uh, very, very uh, negative, and some people find it very, very positive. And folks who find it negative, it's usually because they've experienced or known of that term being used as a slur um, to really dehumanize people um, who have a different sexual orientation than them. Um, it, it's also just had a neutral meaning of being different or strange um, in the English language. Uh, but in the 1980s and 90s in particular, it was really reclaimed uh, through queer spaces, queer movement. And it was reclaimed as a potential positive word for folks to describe themselves for a couple reasons. On one hand, it was there was an uh, activist bent to it. And on the activist end, folks were using queer to say, I don't need to fit in. I don't need to um, you know, get married and have children and have a dog and a white picket fence in order to have rights. And so I don't need to assimilate into normative or mainstream culture in order to have and deserve rights and protection. Um, so that was one of the ways queer was used and is still used. Another way that it was used was in academic spaces to talk about queer theory, to talk about countercultural critique, uh, to talk about um, the ways in which um, different folks um, sort of identify outside of normative ways. In some ways, queer is used as a blurring or blending of lines. You'll notice on this slide that we've listed queer both as a sexual orientation and a gender identity. So folks that use that term might be using it also to sort of say, I fall somewhere in this LGBTQ plus umbrella but I'm not necessarily going to tell you exactly what that's about, and that for some people, sexuality and gender identity do blur together, right? So that's typically how queer is used. You'll find that people of different racial and cultural backgrounds from different parts of the world or of the country may view the word differently and use the word differently. The words bisexual and pansexual um, I can compare and contrast a little bit for you. So as most folks know, bisexual uh, relates to having sexual attraction or romantic attraction um, to people of um, different genders, right? And so some have defined it differently over time. Some have said it's about being attracted to both men and women. But others have said bi could also mean I'm attracted to people of the same gender or different genders which could include more than just men and women. Um, pansexual had originally been used, as I would say, more to contrast from bisexual, originally to say it isn't just two genders, but I'm attracted to all genders. And I would say now it still means that, but for some folks, when they say pansexual, they're also saying that gender might not be uh, a component or the most important component in forming a sexual or relationship bond with another person, that it, it, it goes beyond gender, that it's not even about gender of oneself or of others that one is interested in. And then the term fluid, uh, which can refer to folks who um, 
you know, might feel differently at different points in time. You know, that it's really kind of more open and flowing and who that you feel attracted to, um, you know, might change over time. Um, that it's less sort of constricted by, by any particular identity or label. And there's also asexual. Um, and there, you know, for all of these terms, you may find many communities with sub, uh, sub terms and identities within each of those, uh, those labels that people use to describe themselves. And asexual is a sexual orientation that refers to people who don't experience sexual or sometimes romantic attraction. There's also aromantic for folks that want to be more specific about it. Um, so there are folks who are sexual but aromantic or asexual but romantic. Um, and so this just explains uh, for folks their own experience. Um, and so these can get complicated how individuals use these specific terms. But for example, someone might identify as asexual, primarily referring to not having sexual attraction to others, but that doesn't mean that they never have sex with other people, right? It just refers to the attraction um, or sexual interest that they have and so that may or may not translate into behavior. So there's orientation and identity, but there may also be behavior. Are there any questions, uh, specific questions, about the sexual orientation terms so far? Great. So uh, if you have any questions, we can feel free to come back uh, to these terms. So we'll talk now more about the gender identity terms. So there's lots of different ones here. Um, and I put them in two different columns, partly because, especially with these terms, there's a lot of mixing and matching that happens here. So just because someone is transgender does not mean that they're not also a man or also a woman. Right? So there are trans women, there are trans men, there are also trans people who identify as non-binary, right? Not being a man or a woman, you know. But many trans people are um, identifying as men or identifying as women. So uh, that is the reason um, that I put them in the two columns: is that you can think about the ways that um, that these sort of mix and match for lots of different people. As I mentioned before, queer is a term that sort of blurs the lines. Um, and sometimes people see queer when referring to gender identity specifically as being about uh, non-binary identity. Uh, there was a question here about what's the difference between gender queer versus queer. I would mostly say gender queer simply points out that you're specifically thinking about gender. Um, and queer can be broader and could refer to sexuality or gender. So that's the main difference between the two. Um, looking at some of the non-binary uh, terms here, you get genderqueer, fluid, similar to sexual orientation. Fluid could also refer to gender identity. And again, um, different folks use these terms in different ways. So you really, if you want to understand details behind it, may have to ask, well, what does that mean to you? Um, so that is what fluid can mean. By gender usually refers to folks that identify with um, being both a man and a woman. A gender refers to folks who don't have a particular gender experience. Um, I identify as a gender and go by they and them pronouns um, because and different people do you know identify with certain terms for different reasons. But for me, it's because I don't feel when I think about my internal experience. I think a lot of people. Maybe not, certainly not everyone, but I think a lot of people have a sense of, I'm a man or I'm a woman. And when I look inside, I feel like I don't feel any of those things. I don't feel like I experience a gender. And so that's why I use the term agender uh, to describe myself. Others who use the term might use it, um, you know, even on a more political level or that they reject gender as a category and don't want to be labeled. Um, and so using agender. Uh, could be for some people as much about a politic or a viewpoint as it is about, at least for me, an internal um, lived experience, how that one describes the feelings that one has. Um, 
about who that you are as a person. Um, and then on the right-hand column, you have cisgender, transgender, and queer. So we talked about queer. So transgender is a large umbrella term that refers to um, really anyone who you know, experiences or identifies with or lives uh, a gender or expression that's different from perhaps what they were assigned at birth or what they were socialized to as a child. Um, and so that is what trans refers to. So it's a big umbrella. Um, for some people, you know, that includes non-binary as a subset of transgender. For other folks, uh, they don't necessarily see uh, them. They might identify as non-binary, um, but not transgender. And there, there's a lot of historical and political reasons for that. Um, and so that's the reason to just simply pay attention to how people are using language when they describe themselves. But often, you know, as far as political work, people really combine non-binary and trans work as part of a larger trans umbrella and trans category. Now, cisgender has been a more recently popularized term, um, or sometimes people just say cis, C-I-S, and that, you know, is sort of the antonym of transgender. So instead of crossing, um, that people are staying on the same side. So the identity, the gender identity that you have, or the gender that you have, matches to the sex that you were assigned at birth. And so when we were looking at that slide that had sex and gender, those categories match up with cultural expectations. And so that's the vast majority of people. And it's important that we have this term, um, you know, not, we can also say non-transgender, so cisgender people are non-transgender people, but it's also a way to, to not just define the term based on not being something else. Um, and it's also a way for us to talk about the privilege of not being transgender. So cisgender privilege, what does that mean? It might mean that you don't fear violence while walking down the street. It might mean that when you show your government ID um, in order to access a service that you're not questioned or pulled aside for secondary screening at an airport or something like that. And so that is one important reason why we have the term cisgender. So, you know, someone's asking here if bigender, um, you know, is used to identify with any two genders or if it's specifically used in identifying as both a man and a woman. I've heard it mostly used for folks to identify as both a man and a woman, although I don't see why it couldn't be used to refer to any two genders. Um, but I'd say by and large I've heard it used to refer to being both a man and a woman. Any other questions about some of these terms? Or term, other terms that you've heard um, that are examples of sexual orientations or gender identities that you might like to know more about? We might not answer all of those right now and might save some of them for the Q&A. Any questions or additional terms you want to raise up? All right. If you think of something, go ahead and type it in. And in the meantime, we'll proceed. So everything that we've been talking about so far really is based on a Western and Eurocentric model. You know, these are terms that have developed over a long period of time, and there are actually many different cultural conceptions, um, you know, both in the United States and in other countries that may fall outside of that very Eurocentric model. On this slide, you'll see a number of examples. I'm not going to go into each one in any particular detail, but I might mention, for example, the term from Thailand here. So some of the ones listed on this slide are, most of these are examples of specific genders or sexualities or combinations of the two. But this term pet from Thailand is actually a term that refers to sex, gender, and sexuality all in one single term. Um, and so that says a lot about what a con cultural conception might look like. And in this case, it's not just referring to uh, less common sexualities or genders, uh, queer, uh, queer types of genders or sexualities. It's referring to all sexualities, all genders, and all sexes, all in one 
So that's one example. Another might be if you look at Two-Spirit. Two-Spirit was actually coined in North America by Native American LGBTQ plus activists in the mid-90s. And there's actually many, many different indigenous terms for what, what we might call a third, fourth, or fifth gender. So there are many indigenous conceptualizations of gender um, that have included more than two, and that that's seen as normative, that that's part of the culture and the community is that, and the way of life is that everyone understands, accepts, knows that there are more than two genders and here's what they are. And so you get some examples in specific cultures. Um, and in, in North American indigenous cultures, there's often the idea that a person could have two spirits within them and that that might be seen as a particular individual um, who is what we might call of a third or of, a, of another gender or non-binary gender, but that that's a really culturally understood practice um, and that has a term uh, or terms that are, are associated with it and that go back in history um, for quite some time. Um, and those individuals may have different social roles, just as men and women are often conceived to have specific roles in society. Um, a two-spirit person may have a specific role, which might mean um, that you have a certain special place in ritual or ceremony, that you might be counted as two people at a meeting instead of one. Um, and so there are, there are specific roles and meanings behind these identities. Um, and so that's really different, I think, than some of the you know, more Eurocentric terms and the US-based ideology where it's all about individualism and, and you know, we create all these labels for ourselves and, and claim those identities. There are also very communitarian cultures where simply three, four, five genders exist. And it's not about like going off and being um, really individualistic. It's about you have this role to play in society as a two-spirit person, for example. Uh, you have other terms here, um, for example, same gender loving. There's also a term in Thailand um, that's more recently been created, but that places an emphasis more on love uh, or romance rather than on sex or sexuality. Um, and so really thinking about terms in a different way um, uh, when thinking about sexuality or sexual orientation uh, and moving the emphasis um, towards romance or love can also be a cultural practice. So one model uh, that some folks use, this is from the uh, Trans Student Educational Resources website, you will find the gender unicorn. So this is kind of fun, but let me point out that even though it's called the gender unicorn, that um, only two out of the five sections that they've delineated here are about gender. The other three are about sex or attraction. Um, so th the point of this is to try to give some sort of illustration. You know, gender identity is this thought bubble. It's how you think, how you see yourself, what you experience internally. You know, the little hearts symbols are about the attraction. And then they're showing a a DNA symbol to talk about chromosomes, but also to just talk about sex that you've been assigned. Um, but there could also be sex that you identify with. So this model, you know, has its limitations, but the idea is that you could go down through each of these um, vectors that they put here, right? These little arrows with the circle at the beginning and sort of say, well, you know, my identity, am I uh, not at all a woman? Am I um, sometimes a woman or partly see myself as a woman, or I see myself as like, I'm really at the far end of like, I'm totally a woman on gender identity. And so you could go down and do that similarly for each of these vectors um, of gender identity, of gender expression, of sex, and then physical and emotional attraction. The idea of this type of model, um, really, I would say you can go back and look at the Kinsey scale. So the Kinsey scale goes from zero to six. The Kinsey scale actually refers to something that's not any of these categories. The Kinsey scale was specifically about sexual behavior and who that you had sexual interactions with, right? And so that could be even another way of thinking about this. Um, and so that scale went from zero, which was I'm only 
uh, having sexual behavior with people of the same sex or gender, and six, uh, or excuse me, different sex or gender, and six would be I'm only having uh, sexual behaviors with people of the same sex or gender. Um, and then in the middle was essentially some, you know, like equally I'm having sex uh, or sexual behavior with people of, um, you know, different sexes or genders. And I think at that time you were really thinking only about men and women probably. So that was many, many decades ago. And that's been expanded and you can look up things like the Klein grid and then you have the gender unicorn. And these are simply meant to help think about how complex um, different aspects of identity and status, attraction, and lived experience can be for any particular individual. So we've also included some various concepts here. So we talked about essentially categories sex, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, so we talked about categories, and then we talked about identities or statuses that fall within those categories. But there's some other concepts that might be helpful for folks to be aware of. Um, an important one here um, is microaggression. So I'm pulling a definition from um, a qualitative psychology article here, but they say microaggressions are subtle forms of discrimination, often unintentional and unconscious, which send negative or den and denigrating messages to various individuals and groups. So micro doesn't necessarily mean that the impact is small. It just means that the action um, can be uh, somewhat subtle, right? And that folks who are doing, uh, committing microaggressions may not even be aware that that's what they're doing. Similarly, implicit bias, you know, things that we're not consciously aware of, but it, it may not just be on the individual level, it may also be that the structures, the policies that exist um, have implicit bias embedded into them, that we assume that there are only two genders, or we assume that everyone is heterosexual. Those are examples of how implicit bias, um, that can happen on both an individual level um, where you have an interaction where, say, somebody asks, do you have a girlfriend? Or they ask, do you have a boyfriend? And maybe if they don't know you, they're making some assumptions about your sexual orientation. Um, and the other example then on a structural level might be where you can't get married because of your gender and your partner's gender. Um, and so those are the ways that that's implicit um, in the system. There's also, of course, explicit bias. There's also macroaggressions, things that are larger or seem more purposeful or that are more conscious that people are aware um, that they're intentionally discriminating. Um, those are important to know about as well. Another concept, you know, coming out. So I think most folks have probably heard this term, and that's usually referring to telling the world who that you are, telling your family or friends who that you are or even just telling yourself who that you are, um, that those are aspects of coming out. And I think the biggest myth or thing to be aware of in thinking about that term is that you can just come out and you're done, and that's it. You're, you're just done coming out, you don't have to do it again. And the reality is that coming out can be a lifelong process because of the implicit bias, because of the microaggressions, because of the assumptions that other people can make about you you're often having to explain yourself, um, contradict someone else's assumptions, um, and, and try to explain what is your true story, what is your true narrative, when the world uh, is coming at you with all those assumptions. Um, there are a variety of terms like partner that are gender neutral terms that can refer to someone that you are with romantically or sexually. It could be significant other, it could be someone special, but just we bring that up because we want folks to think about what are some gender neutral ways that you can refer to people, people's significant others that aren't saying, do you have a boyfriend or is, is this your husband, is this your, your girlfriend? You know, using those gendered terms can both be assumptive, um, but if you just simply were to say something like boyfriends and girlfriends or husbands and wives, you're also leaving out um, folks that don't identify as being a man or a woman, 
And so thinking through gender neutral language is also a really helpful um, approach to using more inclusive language. Transitioning is a term that's usually used specifically for the trans community. And so talking about folks that you know, maybe were assigned male at birth, but identify as a woman and have maybe taken some steps. Now those steps can really vary from person to person. For some people, it might just be um, you acknowledge who you are and tell the world who you are, so coming out. But for other folks, that process of transitioning um, could be how that you present yourself or how that you dress or the name that you use or the pronouns that you ask people to refer to you with. Um, it could also um, be about having a physical transition, it could be hormones, it could be surgeries, it could be other things like that, but there is no single process of what transitioning looks like. And the other thing is that more and more in trans communities, we're talking about how not all of our narratives are one of transition and change. Sometimes they're just narratives of explaining to the world who we are um, and not seen as like, now I've become a man or now I've become a woman, but I always was, right? Or I always was non-binary. It's just that now I'm understanding and realizing that and now I'm explaining that to people and I'm trying to live my life more authentically um, and, and not just the way that society has told me I'm allowed to without facing violence. Um, and so it's a complicated concept and one that I would say has been changing. Again, if you have any questions, Feel free to type them into the box. And then finally on this concepts slide, I have internalized oppression. So hopefully we have some understanding of what oppression can mean or discrimination. Oppression, you know, we're talking societal, structural, historical, um, the ways in which there's power involved um, in some of these, uh, these issues, right? Internalized oppression then is just when you turn that onto yourself. You know, it could, this, these kinds of terms, you know, say microaggressions and implicit bias, you know, these aren't just about sexual orientation or gender identity. These could be about race or disability status. Um, it could be about immigration status or nationality. So there are many other ways of thinking about these larger concepts. But internalized oppression is often uh, when you yourself kind of accept the oppression of society on some level and it becomes um, part of either how you don't allow yourself to fully express yourself or be authentic to who you are because you've internalized oppression um, that comes from society and the laws and the structures around you. Um, it could also be that somebody who's you know, dealing with their own internalized oppression may be going and doing negative things to other people of the same group. So one example I've seen historically, and I'm sure it, it probably still happens today, but there are even support groups for, say, transgender women um, who get together and just come and try to support each other. But there have been support groups where, you know, members of the support groups are told, you need to dress properly. You need to come to this meeting dressed as a woman in the ways that we think that a woman is supposed to look. So even within trans communities, we can have ways that we're policing ourselves and each other. And a lot of that comes from internalizing the oppressions of a society that wants to do violence against folks who don't fit gender norms. Any questions about concepts or additional concepts that uh, you'd like to know more about or just share with the group? Feel free to type that in. So here we also put in a quote from a psychologist about what is the impact of microaggressions. So as I was saying, they're not small in the sense that their impact is small. They're simply subtle. Um, and they're maybe smaller in how we think about what that they are. So microaggression could simply be um, using a word that's really problematic or using a word that makes these kinds of implicit bias assumptions um, or implicit assumptions about this is what is allowed to exist in the world. Um, and as researchers have found, these, these can really add up over time, but even these small slights, this is sort of like the death by a thousand paper cut, right? Um, that, that they can be very, very harmful, because, especially because many of these microaggressions 
tap into folks multiple times on a daily basis. And so it really can wear folks down. And so to help equip you all with um, some ways to help avoid that, um, I want to talk about, we talked about term, all the terms we talked about so far can be used pretty well in many contexts. I did mention that queer could be offensive for some people, so that's a reason to sort of pay attention to context. I would say at University of Maryland, using the word queer is not necessarily negative unless you use it that way, right? Even the word gay could be used negatively by folks that say, oh, that's so gay. So no matter what words you choose, you want to think about, as I mentioned at the beginning, context uh, and how context matters. Um, but these are some examples on the next few slides of words that you might want to avoid and what would be some good replacement language for that. So we talked about homosexual and saying gay or lesbian instead. We also mentioned the word intersex, and that is seen as uh, synonymous with the word hermaphrodite, except that we also believe hermaphrodite um, is a medicalized term. Uh, it's been a pathologized term, but it's also been seen as a misnomer in the idea that uh, one has the fully functional reproductive uh, systems and sex organs of male and female, and that's not really whatever happens. Um, and so intersex actually is a broad variety of identities and statuses, um, sometimes seen as medical, um, but that is seen as a more accepted language. Um, instead of saying this is someone's lifestyle or preference, whether it's talking about pronouns or talking about uh, someone's sexuality, um, those imply that they're kind of whimsical, that you just choose it and then that's it. Now, some folks view their lives as, you know, I, I've chosen certain things, but I think for most folks, you know, what you experience as your gender, what you experience as your sexual attraction or romantic attraction is simply something that happens, right? And so in that sense, it's an orientation or an identity. And that's why we use those terms. We have also terms like transvestite, um, transsexual. Uh, so transvestite has not only been a pathologized or medicalized term, but it's also been a criminalized term, like some of these other ones as well. And so for many folks, using a term like cross-dresser is seen as more inclusive. Um, just to clarify what that, that means, it, that has more to do with personal expression or gender expression then it has to do with identity. So for many folks who do cross-dressing, you know, it might be um, a heterosexual man who dresses in women's clothing from time to time. There might be a sexual component to why the person does that, but it's usually not about that person's gender identity. So it doesn't mean that person doesn't identify as a man. It just means that the person identifies as a man and likes to wear clothing associated with women. And so this is not usually uh, categorized as a gender identity, although it could be a cultural identity um, or other identity for some folks that use the term. Now the word transsexual is often, you know, if you were to just look at the specific definition of it, transsexual could be a subcategory under trans or transgender. Um, and it's usually used to refer specifically to folks that medically transition who have hormones or surgeries that support um, you know, a gender confirmation or a gender affirmation um, that one, you know, one's body and identity are, feel more in alignment. Um, many trans people don't necessarily have a medical transition like that. Um, and the term transsexual, because of its medical connotations, I'd say over time it's become seen as more and more negative. This is one where I would say there's the most caveats around because I would say it's been seen as a very okay, acceptable term until the last few years where I think more folks are just wanting to focus on using trans as a larger umbrella term that's more inclusive. Um, transsexual may still be appropriate to referring to specific medical transition, but more often I'm hearing people actually just talk about transition care or trans uh, people getting medical care or uh, gender affirmation, um, surgery, things like that, rather than using the term transsexual. But this one, I would say, varies widely from person to person. 
but it's just something to be aware of that if you're using the term transsexual, it might be because you don't understand that probably a better term would be trans that would include a larger group of people, not just those who um, have a medical transition. And then you have sex change or sex reassignment surgery, things like that. And I'd say more folks are moving towards using terms like gender confirmation or gender affirmation. And this goes back to what I was saying about the term transition and how that may or may not apply to folks. And then finally, um, some folks in the past, many years ago, would say biological man or biological woman to refer really to somebody who, who is cisgender. And so I'd say using cisgender is more appropriate now and acknowledges that um, it also acknowledges that not just gender but sex is also socially constructed and the ways that we view our biology or our bodies um, can really vary from person to person. So we want to avoid um, making it seem like, you know, if you're not transgender that, that somehow things are biologically correct when in reality things can be biologically correct for, um, you know, for trans people as well. We also have the example here of when we talk about pronouns, um, some people say masculine pronouns or feminine pronouns. And that's totally fine for an individual in describing how they view the pronouns that they use. So you know, for many people, saying she or her or being referred to that way is feminine. Um, but when we describe pronouns generally, we don't want to assign a gender to them. So we might just say she or her. And then similarly, when we, we talked about lifestyle versus orientation, um, when instead of saying preferred gender pronouns, we just say personal pronouns or pronouns. What do you go by? Not what do you prefer? Because for many folks, this is not just a preference, it's who they are, it's their lives. We have a bit more information here about pronouns. I'm not gonna go into the details of it, um, but I think it's important to, as much as we're able to, um, create space for people to feel comfortable to share their pronouns. One way that you can do that is to share your own pronouns. So for most people, they go by she, her, hers, and that set of pronouns, and or uh, they go by he, him, his. Now there are a number of folks like me and, and others who might use something that they view as more gender neutral, um, such as they, them, theirs, or the, zero, zeros. but there are other sets of pronouns beyond just these four sets. Um, there was a website mentioned on the first slide, mypronouns.org, and you might find more information and resources there. And in our next webinar, we'll also talk much more about pronouns. And with that, we're going to talk for just a moment about some resources. Hi, my name is John, and I go by he, him, his pronouns. I am a senior on campus. I'm going to briefly tell you about some resources that can help you further your learning and engagement. But first, Take a moment, if you're willing to, please share a resource that has been helpful to, for your own learning about LGBTQ plus terminology and concepts, or about LGBTQ plus inclusion more broadly. It could be a link, a book, or a UMD campus policy or resource you found helpful. If you'd like to share a resource publicly, go ahead and share that now in the chat box. The LGBT Equity Center, which is the presenter of this webinar series, has a website with a variety of information that you may find helpful. Their web address is lgbt.umd.edu. There are also two additional URLs that can point you toward more specific resources within that website. One is rainbowterps.umd.edu, where you can sign up for additional webinars and future trainings. The recording for this session will also appear there in the next week or so. There is also a link to trans.umd.edu, which takes you to the part of the LGBT Equity Center website where you can find resources on transgender-related policies and services on campus. Finally, there are some additional resources that will appear along with the recording of this webinar, which will be available online at rainbowterps.umd.edu in about a week. Great, so we have uh, a minute or two if you have any questions that you'd like to ask about anything that we've covered or anything that we might have missed, please ask your questions now. So one question, is it appropriate for a person to say my pronouns are she, her, hers, or they, them? 
because they don't care how other people address them. Ah, so, right. So many folks, uh, a number of people go by multiple sets of pronouns, and that's totally fine. Um, there can be a lot of different reasons for that. For some folks, especially for trans and non-binary people, um, folks may be trying out different pronouns or want to see what it feels like to be referred to in a different way than that they're used to. And so folks might say, actually, you can call me by any pronouns, or you can call me she, her, or they, them, or she, her, and uh, he, him. And so some folks, um, you know, view pronouns as, you know, or some folks actually say, I don't want to go by any pronouns, please just use my name. And so there are a lot of different ways that people um, approach that. Um, I would say that it's totally fine, um, but also there are folks who are not trans or who are not non-binary identified who go by pronouns that might be different than what society expects. Some people simply want to go by they, them, to, to let other folks know it's okay to not have to gen, you know, have a gendered notion of pronouns to invite other people to use that. I think for most people, they want to go by she, her, or he, him, because that's who they, who they are, what they identify with, and um, what's going to be easiest for other people to understand. Um, but it's totally fine, I think, for people that are not trans to also go by multiple sets of pronouns if they're truly comfortable with that and if that's um, you know, truly how you feel about it. I would say some folks, you know, as one example, um, um, we'll talk about this more in our next webinar, but they may go by um, Ms. instead of Mrs. or Miss because they don't want their title to have anything to do with their marital status. Similarly, some folks might go by they, them pronouns because they don't want their pronouns to have to do anything with gender, even if they have a, you know, a gender as a man or a gender as a woman. Um, so there's lots of reasons for it. I don't know that it muddies the waters, but I do think that folks should sort of notice, um, notice why they're doing these things and, and pay attention and not just dismiss pronouns and say, whatever, any pronouns are fine, unless you really mean that. Um, and one more question, I think that we're pretty much out of time, um, but does encouraging class members to share their personal pronouns at the beginning of the semester run the risk of someone feeling forced to come out to the class even when they may not feel comfortable doing so? So yes, it could run that risk if you force people to share their pronouns. So there are ways to do that that um, don't, don't make people feel forced. I definitely encourage you to check out mypronouns.org but also to check out the next webinar that will address this in much more detail. And so with that, we're going to talk about some action steps. Hi, this is Judith again. <laughs> now to close out, let's talk about some action steps we can take. Take just one moment to think about what was your key takeaway from this session and what you want to do next. If you'd like to share a next step you're committing to in the chat box, go ahead and do that now. Great. Here, you can see a few of our recommendations for next steps. We know the materials in this webinar can get confusing, but it gets easier with practice and upon review. So, we recommend that you review the session and seek additional resources and clarifications. You can also become more mindful about the language you use on a day-to-day -day basis, and when you are conversing about LGBTQ topics, you can visit the LGBT Equity Center which is located in 2218 Marymount Hall, and you can speak with the staff, especially if you have questions that you can't find answers for online. You can also pick up a colorful rainbow turp sticker from the center that you can put on a water bottle, on your vehicle, or at your office or cubicle if you have one. Please also consider signing up for our additional webinar sessions. You can get signed up by going to Rainbow Terps umd.edu. Our next webinar session is coming up on Tuesday, March 7th at noon, and it will focus on trans-inclusive language and practices. And finally, 